Hello and welcome. I am a mysterious disembodied voice in the ether. Today we are taking a look at a mechanics paper for A2 maths. So let's get started. Uh, worth noting before we uh, get into the actual questions that this is meant to be about how to approach the questions, insights into anything that's particularly challenging, that sort of thing, rather than about trying to do full work solutions and the answers. Uh, the answers are in the mark scheme, and full work solutions to an entire paper would probably be a little bit long for one video, but we'll see. So, mechanics. Let's get started. First question, we have a particle on a light inextensible string. The other end of the string is attached to a fixed point on a smooth horizontal plane. We move at a constant speed of 5 meters per second. So, this is circular motion. Um, nice and simple, that's all we're really dealing with. Circular motion, there are various equations that you may learn. Um, they all ultimately turn into one another. Um, two key ones are V equals omega R. That relates the two types of velocity for circular motion. And then the other one relates these to the force. And probably the best way to remember it is F equals M R omega squared or uh, M V squared squared over R. Uh, you, by substituting the one on the left into the ones on the right, you can turn them into each other. So, if we use in this case f equals mv squared over r, we have m, we have v, we have r, so we can find the force. The tension in the string is the force supplying our centripetal force. So there we go. And that was it. Cool. Question two. We have a semicircle. What's it doing? Uniform frame consists of a semicircular arc together with its, with its diameter. Calculate the distance of the center of mass of the frame from O. Interesting. So, uh, what formula do they want you using for this? Interesting. So, um, they have a there, there is so I I think I think they must have some kind of um, formula that you are supposed to know for where the center of mass of a semicircle lies. Um, I think it involves sine of something over, you know, sine of theta over theta or something like that. Um, so yeah, they've got something along those lines in it. And the idea being that the center of mass of our semicircle is going to be somewhere around here. Let's call it, oh wait, we already have a C. Uh, Oh, we'll call it blue C for the sake of argument. Um, too late now. We have the center of mass of the semicircle, and O, by symmetry, is the center of mass of our line. So then, to find the actual center of mass of the frame, we're just doing our weighted average of positions, uh, or moments, depending on what you want to call it. Um, we're doing a weighted average of positions. The mass ratio is going to be the ratio of the lengths. So the length of our semicircle is a half times pi times the diameter. Uh, pi times the diameter is the circumference, half of that for a semicircle, and the diameter. So you're going to do a weighted average with the lengths of the positions in height, and you have the height of C, which you've worked out from your formula. 
So there we go. The frame is freely suspended at A and hangs in equilibrium. So A is the corner on the left. Calculate the angle between AC and the vertical. So the idea is, if it is hanging in equilibrium and we have an actual centre of mass, let's call it G, we have an actual centre of mass somewhere here, that the vertical is going to go from the point where it is hanging to the center of mass. And so this is our vertical line. And we want this angle here. Well, we know this length, this is 0 0.3 A to O, and we know this length because it's what we calculated in this question here. If we know the opposite, we know the adjacent, we can do inverse tan to get to the angle. My apologies. All right, so moving on. We have a particle moving along the x-axis on a horizontal surface. Uh, at displacement x, we have a velocity v. Two horizontal forces act on the particle. Excellent. Show that v dv by dx is equal to some certain set of things. So, right, the key idea here is to say, well, F equals M A, which means that the acceleration is the force which you have been given divided by the maths, the, the maths, the mass. Force divided by mass gives you your acceleration so just divide each of these forces by uh, 0 0.8. And then this one is positive. The other force is negative. And so you have plus this one over 0 0.8 minus this one over 0 0.8 gives you your acceleration. OK. Acceleration is dv by dt. And then you're using your chain rule. So your chain rule says, well, if I have dv by dt is equal to dv by dx, dx by dt. dx by dt is just v. And so this is v dv by dx. Um, I'm assuming th th this is not something that immediately jumps out, so I'm assuming that this is something that you're relatively used to doing. If you aren't, there you go. That's what you're looking for. Um, so one side you are finding the acceleration, and then the other side you're just turning your acceleration into something that's just in terms of v and x rather than t. Okay. The velocity of P as it passes through O is 6 meters per second. Find the velocity of P when X equals 2. Fair enough. So now we are solving a differential equation. OK, so we want to separate the variables. And in this case, this is nice and easy. This side is all X's. So we just bring our DX up and we integrate. So we have the integral of V dV is equal to the integral of 5 e to the minus blah 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 dx. Oh dear, why my pen is working appallingly today. I really don't know why. Oh well, we will survive. Um, 5 e to the minus x minus 3x squared dx. Okay, we can integrate this. This integrates fairly nicely. This becomes v squared over 2. This becomes minus 5e to the minus x minus 6, uh, sorry, minus x cubed plus c because we're doing indefinite integrals. Then origin o, so o, what, what it's saying when it says passes through o is really that's, I can't write small for some reason. 
O means that X is equal to zero because it's the origin, right? So what we've been given here is that when X equals zero, V equals six, that allows us to fix our value of C that we get from the integrals, our plus C. Once we've got that, we just have a regular equation for V and X. So we put X in, we get V out by rearranging. Nice and simple. Okay. Part four. A small ball B is projected from a point O with speed 14 meters per second at an angle of 60 degrees above the horizontal. Calculate the speed and direction of motion of B for the instant 1.8 seconds after projection. So, what we are dealing with here is a SUVAC question, ultimately, right? We are saying we have a speed of u in the horizontal in in the, the direction 60 degrees above the horizontal. So there are two components to this. We have a horizontal component, u cos 60. That is not going to be changing. We have a vertical component, which is going to be changing due to gravity. And so what we want to do is say, OK, what is our new, new speed? v equals u plus a t at a time 1.8 seconds after projection in the vertical capacity, in the vertical direction. And then we recombine our new vertical component with our unchanged horizontal component to get the speed. So what we end up with is our new v, which is 14 sine 60 minus 9.8 times 1.8 for our it, minus 9.8 is our acceleration due to gravity, t is 1.8. And then we do that squared plus our horizontal component squared to get the speed and direction you can get similarly. You're just doing trig at that point. So that's the key idea. Split it into vertical and horizontal components. Horizontal one doesn't change. Vertical is just SUVAP with gravity. Calculate the time after projection when B reaches the plane. So that is just, once again, using SUVAP, now we want s equals zero, or rather uh, we want s equals minus two, more to the point, right? So what we're saying is we have a plate that's not even remotely flat. Let's try that again. We have a plane. Close enough. We are starting from some point. I can't draw large points. We are starting from some point O that is two meters above the plane. So if we have a total distance of minus two, we have reached the plane. And that's where we get to here. So we want, oh, we want S equals minus two. And we have S equals U T plus a half A T squared. So we can find T. I don't know what's going on there. All right. Um, yeah, cool. Let's move on. Question five. We have a particle of mass 0.2 kilograms attached to a fixed point A by a light inextensible string and B by a light inextensible string, as shown all in the diagram. Given that the tensions in the two strings are equal, calculate the speed of P. So, if we have equal tension in the two strings, right, so this one is a little bit fun, but here we go. So, the key idea here is working with angles. Um, I think, unless there's a particularly easier way to do it.
I don't think there is necessarily, so uh, we will go with that unless. Hmm. All right, let's see. Is there a much easier way to do it? Okay. There are different ways that you could go about this. They have an interesting formula going on over there. Um, yeah, so what do you can take advantage here of here? If you, so the, in principle, right, in principle, what you want to be doing is saying, first of all, if it's moving in a horizontal circle, it has to have balanced forces vertically. Okay. You can figure out that you have a component of this tension upwards. I can't draw an arrow. And this is really frustrating. You have a component of this B tension downwards. And then you also have M, G, G downwards. Balance those three. You know M, you know G. Balance those three forces. By balancing those three forces, you're able to find what the tension T in the strings is. And then you're able to add the horizontal components to get the centripetal force. Centripetal force mv squared over r, that gives you your velocity. Um, part of the key, or the trickiest part to this, is figuring out the angles. And what you want to make to do is, the, the simplest way is to make use of the fact that this is actually a 3, 4, 5 triangle, right? This is a right angled triangle, and so you know that this length is 0 0.5, right? 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5. It's the same ratio. It's a three point. It's a three four five triangle. So, if we have a three four five triangle, that lets us work out these angles. And you can say that this angle here is the same as this angle here, and this angle here is the same as this angle here. What? Once you know this side, these angles are nice and easy to work out. You can also do it just from tans uh, without that, but yeah, either way works. Once you've got those angles, you can do sine and cos to get the horizontal and vertical components and so on and so forth. It is given that instead that p moves with its least possible angular speed for motion in this circle. Find this angular speed. Okay. So the key idea here is that we want to, so in the first part, the key that we were given was that the tensions in the two strings were equal, right? In this second part, we are given least possible angular speed 
instead. So now we do not have equal forces in our two strings. The best way to minimize these forces is to say, well, okay, here, when we're balancing out the forces, we have an extra force adding to gravity, right? Which is also adding to our, uh, to our centripetal force. If we want to minimize, then actually we want to just be balancing out gravity with this component up here. Yeah? So, if we want, so what we want then is to say, well, we're going to balance out gravity with just this force. So we need T, let's call it TA, uh, cos of theta is equal to mg. Balance that. Once you've done that part, then you can just talk about having the horizontal component balancing out here. And you essentially have no tension in this, in this string, right? Because any tension in this string is adding to the force that you need. So yeah, the, the idea here is that this string is unnecessary if you're going at the minimum possible speed. Um, so yeah. All right. Kind of feel like I've trailed off there, but there we go. We've explained that. Let's move on. Uh, I think we have... Okay, yeah. So we've got two questions left. All right. This one, we have a moments question. So by taking moments about D, show that the tension in the rope is 146 newtons correct to three significant figures. So the moment for the tension in the rope is actually nice and simple, right? We have tension in the rope, T here. We have a perpendicular distance of 0.8. So the moment anti-clockwise is just 0.8 times T, the tension in the rope, about D, right? Perpendicular. What we are looking for more specifically is the weight of our block. Now, you could do this by finding the exact coordinates of the center of mass and then working out perpendicular distance. But there is an easier way than this, which is to say, well, I know that I have a symmetric block, and so my center of mass is going to go through the middle of the block with a distance here of 0. 0.5. Seven, five. That looks horrible, but never mind. Um, I'm going to have half the distance to the center of mass. That is my perpendicular distance from D. But I now have a force which is not the weight of the block. It's the weight of the block times it's the weight of the block with a component this way. But we know the angle. We know that this is 30 degrees because we've got this over here, right? And these angles match up. So we have the weight cos 30 is our force and our perpendicular distance of 0 0.75. So that's actually the easiest way to look at this is rather than taking the direction of our force and uh, trying to find a perpendicular distance, which is hard, we take the perpendicular distance to where our force is acting, and then we take the perpendicular component of the force. Sorry, we take the distance to where our force is acting, and we take the perpendicular component of the force. I think that makes sense. All right. OK, cool. Um, I'm getting myself in a muddle here. This is, this is not. Yes, fair enough. So given that the block is in limiting equilibrium, calculate the coefficient of friction between the block and the floor. So 
limiting equilibrium means our block is trying to move around here. Best way to take this now is to isolate the moment from the frictional force. Uh, and I would argue that the easiest way to do that is taking moments about our center of mass. Okay, so we know where our center of mass is from symmetry. We've got 0.4 up here uh, and 0.75 across here. If you take moments about here, you have, once again, your tension T in one direction, pulling it anti-clockwise. And so your frictional force is going to be along here, pushing it clockwise at a different distance. Once you work out those moments, you know that they have to be exactly equal and you can work out your frictional force. If you know that your frictional force is at maximum, then you know that your frictional force is mu n. Mu the coefficient of friction times the normal reaction force. Your normal reaction force is going to be the weight of the block plus the downward component of your tension because your tension is also pulling the block down. The downward component of the tension in this case is T sine 30. So you combine the weight of the force with T sine 30 and then you equate that to the frictional force that you can find from moments. Um, so yeah. You can also, more simply, actually, yes, probably a lot simpler, you can also say, well, the weight of the block is not moving it side to side. Um, Why am I getting myself so confused here? Shouldn't the friction be going the other way? I guess not. Fair enough. So where's the horizontal equilibrium? I'm getting myself deeply confused here. Why am I getting myself confused with A-level mechanics? Friction always messes everything up. Why can't we just do nice Lagrangian mechanics? Um, okay. Yes. So, I think in this case, um, actually, for this question, you are better off ignoring moments entirely and just doing regular equilibrium, right? You have this, you have a downward force on the block, mg, you have a force at an angle of 30 degrees to the horizontal of T, and then you have a sideways force of F due to friction that must balance out. Um, and you also have a normal reaction force to the block from the floor. Okay. you know that F is equal to mu n if we are in limiting friction. You can balance all of these out, you can find n. Um, uh, you can find mu even, so yeah. Yeah, you can find n by balancing vertically, and then you can find mu by balancing horizontally. 
That's the best way to do this question. Ignore the moments entirely, actually. So, yeah. All right. A particle P of mass 0.4 kilograms is attached to a light elastic string of natural length 0.8 modulus of elasticity 32 newtons. The other end of the string is attached to a fixed point O and we are released from rest at O. Calculate the distance OP at the instant when P first comes to instantaneous rest. So, key idea here, I would say, is elastic energy. All right, so we are saying we have a point O, we have a natural length, which is somewhere by here, and we have a final resting length at P. All right, during this time, there is no force due to the um, string. So we are going to gain energy. More to the point, ultimately, actually. So you can look at it in terms of kinetic energy. There is a simpler way, which is to say, at O, we were at rest. At P, we are at rest. So there is no kinetic energy at either of these points. So what we actually want to look at is to say, where has the energy gone? So at P, we have transferred some gravitational potential energy. We have transferred mgh, where h is this distance here. We have also, we have put that all into elastic potential energy. And the elastic potential energy you have from your formula, which is... Uh, depending on your thing, it's going to be your modulus of elasticity times the extension over the natural length times a half x squared, I think. Um, yeah, so it should be half extension squared modulus of elasticity over the natural length. That sounds about right. Um, so it should be a half x squared, uh, depending on what you want to call it, uh, lambda over L. That's your elastic, uh, elastic potential energy. We have put all of our gravitational potential energy into uh, elastic potential energy, and so you can equate these. All right. H is the distance that you are looking for. You know the rest of these. Uh, you can turn, you can take X in terms of H, right? X is just H minus the natural length. And so this will give you a quadratic equation in terms of H, which you can solve to find the height. A horizontal plane is fixed at a distance one meter below O. The particle P is again released from rest at O. Calculate the speed of P immediately before it collides with the plane. So immediately, this tells you to go back and check. Hopefully, our answer H was larger than a meter, because we're told that it's going to collide with our meter plane. Calculate the speed immediately before it collides with the plane. So at the plane, we have a natural length of 0.8, right? So the idea is, here is our plane at one meter. Here is our natural length at 0.8. So at our plane, we have gained, uh, we have gained m g h, where h is now a meter, gravitational potential energy. We have lost a half x squared lambda over l, but now x, well, x is just this extension, which is 0.2 meters, right? It's the difference between our natural length and where we are. So we have lost that much. We have gained this much energy. And therefore, the difference, mgh minus our a half x squared lambda over L, is going to be our kinetic energy. We know our kinetic energy. We do a half m v squared, we know m, we can get our velocity, we can get our speed. 
In the collision with the plane, P loses 96% of its kinetic energy. Well, we can work out 4%, we know how much it's got left. Calculate the distance OP. So again, just the, the distance down at the instant when P first comes to instantaneous rest above the plane, given that this occurs when the string is slack. So, once again, we want to do energy calculations. So now we can say, well, if we take 4% of, uh, of our kinetic energy that we figured out when it reached the plane, that's the kinetic energy it has as it goes up. So it's going up with some amount of kinetic energy. It's going to come to rest at some point here that's going to be a distance d above the plane. So mgd is going to equal our 4% kinetic energy. 4% kb. And then 1 meter minus d, because up here is O, and this is now our particle p, 1 meter minus d is this distance that we are looking for, OP. Because we're always doing this in terms of distances from our starting point, right? It's easier to work out our distance up that we've gone since we started with some amount of kinetic energy, because that's a nice conversion to make, but then we need to convert it into our distance the other way. Uh, the reason that we can do this with while ignoring all of the elastic energy is that we're told this happens when the string is slack. And we only have elastic energy in this region, not this region. OK, that brings us to the end of the paper. Hopefully this was helpful to you. Um, yeah, please leave some feedback in comments or wherever. And uh, I will see you next time. Goodbye.